If you're feeling strong, pick up the gargantuan Penguin Guide to Jazz on CD and make for the P's. There, right next to each other, you'll find two of the most important saxophonists in the history of modern music, Charlie Parker and Evan Parker. Charlie's story has been told many times, in books, documentaries and even a movie. Evan has yet to hear from Hollywood. For the best part of four decades now, Evan Parker has occupied a central position in the world of improvised music. His playing, ideas and commitment to innovation have inspired his fellow musicians to new heights and resulted in an unparalleled body of work. A list of Evan's collaborators includes virtually every major free jazz player, plus Yoko Ono, Charlie Watts and, believe it or not, Vic Reeves. Over the next three weeks, primarily with the help of Evan himself, this series will focus on the ideas and encounters that have shaped his radical music. Evan Parker was born in Bristol in 1944. His mum played the piano and liked listening to Fats Waller. His dad liked singing in the church choir. At the age of 14, and relocated with his family to the wastelands of Greater London, Evan acquired an alto saxophone and began lessons with the local teacher. That was James Knott. Fantastic man. Stone communist, like a lot of the musicians in the Union at that time. That time, the Union was very left. He um, lived in a particular way, and at that time, it was, I think, very unusual to to find somebody that was into Whole Foods and uh, eco ecological issues before there was even a, anything you could call a, the beginnings of a green movement. It was that style of uh, person, rather free thinking, and uh, very taught me a lot more than just how to play the saxophone. <laughs> In fact, he, I think he probably thought he never quite managed to do that. Evan's closest school friend at the time was a boy named Peter Smiles. Peter was learning baritone sax, and together the two of them worked hard trying to play the music of Paul Desmond and Jerry Mulligan. Then came John Coltrane. I suppose that um, I started to get interested just around the time where Coltrane was thinking of leaving... Miles's band, so that that would probably have been 59, 60. And, um, of course, he came to Europe with, with Miles, but didn't come to England because he left the band in Sweden. And, and then a year later, he, he's back with his own band, with the, uh, the f phenomenal band with Elvin and McCoy Tyner and um, Eric Dolphy. And one week after the Village Vanguard, the original live at the Village Vanguard record, Walthamstow Town Hall, Amazing idea. Yes. Blissful. It was ecstatic, wonderful. It's the only time that I, I was, uh, you know, able to hear Coltrane live, and of course, it assumes a kind of mythic uh, value for me now. A year after his blissful experience with John Coltrane in Walthamstow, Evan was off to Birmingham University to study botany. Perhaps unsurprisingly, ferns and algae didn't get a look in. By his second year, it was clear that Evan had become distracted. I fell among anarchists and philosophy students who were thinking about Wittgenstein, and they said, you, you seem to know more botany when you arrived than you do now, which was true. I did, but I was busy with other things. And um, the great thing was uh, meeting players 
that I, you know were interested loosely in the same kind of things that I was. And we we had a band that tried to play monk tunes and Coltrane tunes, and you know that was my first real working band. <laughs> By the end of his time at university, Evan had three gigs a week and was working hard to emulate Coltrane's sound on both soprano and tenor sax. Bizarrely, science fiction was about to have a major impact on his life. I was asked by a guy that was in film school to make um, music for his final year dissertation uh, film project, which was a part of the Ray Bradbury uh, Fahrenheit 451, is it? It's the temperature at which paper burns, isn't it? And uh, he wanted some futuristic music, and I did some futuristic music. And thank God the tapes of that are lost. They probably will surface at some point, but I've got no idea what, what it sounded like. But what I do remember is it made me think about a few things, which is that if you can imagine music of the future, why is it in the future? And um, these kind of ideas have carried on interesting me ever since, really. Um, the role of anticipation and imagination in in producing change in the music that in in a way you have to conceptualize possibilities before you can attempt to, to solve those or turn them into sounds technically and so that dealing with that idea of playing futuristic music threw me into a kind of turmoil in a way that that what wow Maybe there are possibilities here. I don't know. They were half formulated anyway. They were very unclear. But when the film was shown, Alfreda Bench was also in the same uh, department with uh, Gavin Owen, the guy that made the film, and she heard the music and had heard the music before the, the, the diploma show itself, and she recommended at the diploma show that John Stevens check out the music for this film. And then we got into a... Very interesting conversation. I told John that I'd heard his broadcast uh, from earlier that summer when I was working at the Cabris factory on the night shift. And um, I'd already been listening to some of the same records that he was interested in, the Albert Eiler ESPs, the various ESPs, the, the Ornette Coleman records. So... This, in a way, it was in that first conversation, it was almost like an audition. What do you know? Where are we going to go from? And I think somehow I became the apprentice. Writer Richard Williams. Uh, Evan Parker's name first came into my uh, view when um, when he started playing with John Stevens at, at the Little Theatre Club in London, which was the sort of uh, crucible of the British free jazz movement. John was a great organiser 
You know, he was the one who would get the gigs. I think he found the little theatre club and persuaded the woman who ran it to let them play there, you know, several nights a week, which was quite an achievement um, because there wasn't, you know, there wasn't much of an audience for, for that music. But gradually, John gathered musicians around him, Trevor Watts, Evan Parker, Kenny Wheeler, Barry Guy, Jeff Klein, and so on. Um, people who were interested in investigating the possibilities of free improvisation, uh, who had a, a grounding in jazz, in most cases, uh, some like Derek Bailey in dance music, others like Barry Guy in classical music. But they all worked together to try and develop a kind of free improvisation that owed a lot to jazz, that couldn't have existed without jazz, but that wasn't really jazz in the conventional sense. John's idea was that if you were playing so loud that you couldn't hear what everybody else in the band was doing, then you were playing too loud, very simple. And the other thing was if you're playing without making due reference to what other people are playing, then you may as well be playing solo. So the, the effect of these two maxims or rules of thumb were that... Uh, we produced this very detailed, um, speedily interactive music. As John Stevens pushed his ideas further and further, the spontaneous music ensemble reduced down to a duo between himself and Parker. The intensity of the situation forced the young saxophonist to examine his own playing. I think by this point I must have thought, well, you've got to try and do something original. And um, what can that be? You know, there's Albert Eiler there wailing away in the overtones and uh, Pharaoh Sanders has got that articulation uh, you know, triple tonguing or whatever it is. Maybe if you can get some of that overtone control on the one hand and some of that triple tonguing, maybe you can build a sound on the strength of that. Quite, in a way, quite an artificial idea. But you know, looking to have a sound, sound of my own, as it were. Something. What can I do? You know, that's already everybody's already doing everything, which is the way the scene must always look to a young player. Everybody's, it's all been done. Where can I? There's no place for me. And then out of desperation, one or two things may become. And if, if they start to work, then you can build on your own discoveries and, and slowly, slowly you're building a voice for yourself. And um, so the, the idea of working, especially with the sort of approach to double tonguing that I, that I developed, um, worked very well with, with speedy articulation of drums and Explain to us exactly what you mean by double or triple tonguing. What do we mean by well, that? Well, tonguing is just to attack a note with the tip of the tongue. So without being too technical about it, the airstream over the reed is interrupted by, obviously, you stop the reed's vibration with the tongue and you start the reed's vibration by taking the tongue off the reed. And the double tonguing thing was using up and down attacks uh, on the reed. I think you hear Charlie Parker use it sometimes. Da, 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 you know, especially when he's about to launch into one of those bluesy phrases. Da, 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 dee, da, where the reed is hit 
in both directions, but I extended that to be able to keep it up indefinitely. While Evan was busy perfecting his tonguing technique, word of the London scene was spreading across mainland Europe. In 1967, German bass player Peter Kowold, a close associate of saxophonist Peter Brotsman, arrived in town scouting for talent. He found his way to the stage of the Little Theatre Club, and impressed by what he heard, he quickly organised a meeting on home turf. As a result, Evan Parker and John Stevens travelled to Germany that December and participated in a free jazz workshop. A very happy moment for me because then we, I met Brotsman, I met uh, Don Cherry, Albert Mangelsdorf, Gene Lee, Marion Brown. Uh, very interesting occasion, you can imagine, for me. Suddenly I'm thrown into a, another level of activity completely. I still remember the first notes I have from Brotsman's horn, frightened, frightened to death. So how can a, how can anyone make so much sound on, on the saxophone. Back in London, a funky little label called Island Records invited the spontaneous music ensemble to record an album. At the time, so-called experimental music was establishing a strong underground following, and even giants like CBS were showing an interest. Appropriately enough, Island gave John and Evan a free hand. We um, talked on the phone about what should we do? This is a great special occasion. We've got the chance to do something. We, shall we just do it as a duo, or sh shall we invite some of them? some of the players, some of the great guys. And we arrived at uh, the idea we should ask Derek Bailey, Kenny Wheeler, who'd been in the very earliest versions of SME, and Dave Holland, who'd been a guest on various occasions at the Little Theatre Club. And that was, that was it. We just thought, well, if we could get those three, what a great idea. And that's it. We leave everything else to intuition. And that's the way the, the record was done. John later um, claimed that it was him, his composition because he'd counted one. He said, I'm just going to count three. And on the basis of that, he registered the whole piece as, as his composition. But we, we sorted that out later. People who listen to the, the CD now will miss as compared with the vinyl, apart from all the noise and the, the, the extra stuff that vinyl freaks love, uh, distortion and so on. Uh, 
What they won't hear is the doorbell being rung by Yoko Ono was uh, outside and there was some breakthrough in the, the wiring in the, uh, the circuitry at Olympic Studios and the doorbell somehow leaked onto the tape. And um, she came in and listened for a bit. After we met Yoko, we did, um, I think, two gigs with, with Yoko, Derek Bailey, John Stevens, and myself. Very interesting. The Spontaneous Music Ensemble's first album, complete with Yoko on doorbell, was released as Carrie Obin. Carrie Obin, read the album cover, are the imaginary birds said to live in paradise, and such were the times that the record was readily available in local branches of Woolworths. Two months after the recording, Evan packed his tenor and set off for Germany for a stint with the Peter Brotsman Octet. It was May 1968, and paradise-dwelling birds were not on the agenda. The music that resulted from the tour was quickly released on Brotsman's own label, as machine gun. Obin and Machine Gun, which came out in the same year, really defined the two polarities of European free improvisation. Carrie Obin was a very refined, rather kind of pointillist work. Um, it sounded more like European classical music than previous European versions of jazz, I would say. And then you had Peter Brotsman's Machine Gun, which was energy music, you know, which was all about the expression of a kind of ferocious energy that was uh, one kind of reaction to life in Europe in the, in the late 1960s. You know, I, I, I would say Machine Gun had a lot to do with things like, you know, the May 68 protests and just the feeling of insurrection that was around. Whereas what the SME were doing was generally a more introspective, uh, reflective kind, kind of music. That's a simplification, but there's you know, some truth to it. And if you listen to them now, you can hear clearly hear the music heading in two different directions and some of the same musicians, you know, going in both directions at the same time, which made it even more interesting. I think to begin with, it was a very schizophrenic um, situation for me. You know, Dr. Jekyll and Mr. Hyde, you know, I had to be one in one place and the other in the other and somehow still be struggling with this idea of what are you? What do you do? You know, you're not just there to uh, play the saxophone. You're there to represent yourself playing the saxophone as well. You're an artist. You're not. You're not. You're not a hired gun. And uh, yeah, at that point, I can't say anything other than to agree with you. What, wait a minute. What is there that connects those two things apart from a guy who desperately wants to? be a saxophone player, a creative saxophone player, and will try his best to make sense of whatever situation he's in that allows that, allows him to continue with that dream, you know. Evan's early experiences in Europe widened his perspective and changed him as a player. The musicians he met in the first few months, like Brotsman, 
Anne Benning, Misha Mengelberg and Alex von Schlippenbach became his friends and collaborators for the next 30 years. Back in London, immediately after the machine gun tour, Evans sensed that John Stevens was troubled by his trip. John was a kind of all or nothing character and there was this famous conversation where uh, he, he set up a, an appointment to talk very seriously to, to me about my future in the SME um, was jeopardised by these long, long absences from the scene. You know, I'd been away for 10 days and things were moving so fast in the music at that point that John was scared that I'd be left behind. And um, so there started to be a little bit of tension between us, uh, which finally, in the end, uh, since I was already starting to work with Derek Bailey and Jamie Muir in a group that became the Music Improvisation Company, then it became clear that for the moment, John and I would have to work separately. Later on, we resolved all of that, thank, thank goodness. Shortly after Evans' break with John Stevens, the Music Improvisation Company, with Hugh Davis on Live Electronics, recorded their first album with a fledgling European label called ECM. Around the same time, Evan, Derek Bailey and drummer Tony Oxley formed the now legendary Incus record label and started to document the music they'd helped set in motion. Four years earlier, Evan Parker had seen himself as an apprentice, struggling to find his own sound. In 1970, he was a key player, driving the music forwards. I was starting to think of improvisation as a, a bigger, more open set of possibilities than the classic SME approach allowed. And although that was a very important element and still remains to this day a very important element of the what you could call the lingua franca of, of uh, improvised music, I think even more important at this point is is the music improvisation company style language which incorporates uh, the possibility of playing louder than somebody else at some point or the, uh, the possibility of re repetition, uh, possibility of drones, feedback, all of these kind of things that w were not really present inside the classic SME at that point. So it was really opening the thing up. 